Hi, welcome to Lion Rajbhavan's classroom. In this lecture number 36 of module 4 in Mass Transfer 1 course by Dr. Rajmohan, we will learn about cooling towers. Cooling towers. See, in most of the power plants and chemical industries, we always operate the unit operations or unit processes at high temperatures, right? So the process streams as well as the water, wastewater or flue gases leaving those unit operations will be at very high temperatures and we have to cool the products formed or the react and unreacted raw materials all needs to be cooled down to room temperature, right? And similarly, the water, wastewater or the flue gases that are leaving the unit streams needs to be brought down to atmospheric temperature before we let them go into the atmospheric air or waste river waters okay so water if you are supplying the hot water into the water sources water bodies what will happen the aquatic life will be affected because if fish is there tortoise are there crocodiles are there when you supply some hot water at 80 degrees Celsius, obviously they will get affected. The plants living in it also will get affected, right? And that is that's why whatever is the water that we are coming out of any industry that needs to be cooled down, or we may be recirculating the water. So for any purpose, we have to cool down the temperature of the water coming out of unit processes and unit operations to room temperature. Okay, so for that we make use of atmospheric air okay we bring atmospheric air and the hot water in contact with each other either in cross current fashion or counter current fashion so this atmospheric air which is at uh, atmospheric temperature will take away the heat from the wastewater meanwhile the water sometimes may get condensed because if it is vapor or some water is being evaporated along with the air so there it is called evaporative cooling Okay, sometimes evaporative cooling also will take place. Some amount of water will be carried away by the air. That way, air is getting humidified because the water is getting evaporated into the air means air is getting humidified. That's why this cooling tower comes under the operation, unit operation of humidification. Okay, and what we are doing in this particular cooling tower, we bring liquid that is hot liquid to come in contact with atmospheric air so what we are doing in this unit operation we bring hot liquid to come in contact with atmospheric air which will reduce the temperature okay so reduce the temperature of the water meanwhile some amount of water will be evaporated along with the air okay so this can be carried out in cross current fashion or counter current fashion and there are several type of cooling towers available remember the water uh, availability is an important issue because there are several countries in which there is no sufficient amount of water which is available for industrial operations okay so if there is surplus water is there and there are scarcity of water is there so for depending upon either we have surplus water resources or there is scarcity of water the operation of this cooling tower will be either once through or there will be recirculating one so recirculating of water will be there in the industry so that way it depends upon the water available nearby the industry we will either use once through cooling towers or recirculating cooling towers okay so what water is needed for heating the things also because we will be in most of the industries water will be used to heat the waste heat available from any operation will be used to vaporize the water into steam that steam will be used for uh, changing the temperature or maintaining the temperature in any unit operation for example heat exchanger some liquid is there which needs to be heated for that also we will supply steam as the heating medium right in heat, heat transfer course you might be studying all these shell and tube heat exchanges where the product fluid has to be heated from a lower temperature to higher temperature when it is entering the reactor for example if the reactor is operating at 500 degrees celsius and you are having your raw material stored at a room temperature of 30 degrees celsius 
so we cannot directly send this raw material at 30 degree celsius into the reactor which is operating at 500 degree celsius because we are up maintaining a 500 degree celsius in the reactor when the raw material is entering at 30 degree celsius the heat that you are supplying to the reactor will be used to heat the raw material from 30 degree celsius to 500 degree celsius but we don't want to do that in the reactor so what we can do before sending the reactor uh, raw materials into the reactor we can have a heat exchanger unit which can preheat this raw material from 30 degree celsius to 500 degree celsius if not in single stage we can use three series of heat exchangers we can convert 30 to 150, 150 to 350, 350 to 500 like that. Okay, it depends upon the capacity of the heat exchanger. Okay, so that way we will use this steam produced in the industry to preheat the raw material from room temperature to required temperature of 500 degrees Celsius. Same way, after this reactor we got the product right but the the stream that is leaving the product stream that is leaving the reactor will be at 500 degrees celsius but again we want to cool this product stream to a room temperature of 30 degrees celsius in that way what we have to do we have to remove heat right so that way we can use the industrial waste water we can use the cooling water uh, we can use the we can sorry we can send water into this another heat exchanger and the fluid stream is uh, the product stream is leaving at 500 degrees celsius we want to reduce the temperature to room temperature so then we can send in some water which will absorb the heat which will take away the heat from the product stream in a heat exchanger so that way again we, we are gaining heat there right we are removing the heat from the product stream so that way water is getting converted to steam in another heat exchanger so that way either for heating purpose or cooling purpose water is must in a industry not only in chemical industries most of the power plants which are operating at higher temperatures there also a lot of steam is generated steam needs to be cooled and that water needs to be brought down to a temperature of room temperature before discarding it off or before recirculating it so that way cooling tower is a common uh, thing which will be a tall unit present in all of the power plants okay most of the thermal power plants or uh, any other power plants you will observe cooling towers being present that way mechanical engineers also learn this cooling tower in detail okay so in this lecture we will see what are what is a cooling tower what are the different type of cooling towers available and we will see how to design a cooling tower using a height of the packed tower as you can packed material also being used in cooling tower we will see the components of a cooling tower where we will see you can see uh, appreciate that uh, packing materials are being used right to let the provide the gas and liquid contact remember it is a gas liquid contact equipment okay it may be acting under it may come under adiabatic operation of gas and liquid system okay so we in, in a typical cooling tower you are going to have several components in which packing material and packed bed height will be coming into picture so that way similar to absorption or for uh, any gas liquid operation we have derived expression for ntu htu concept right to high find the height of the packed tower we have seen what is ntu and what is htu how to derive them same way we will derive an expression for height of the packed tower for cooling operations and towards the end of this model we will we will solve numerical to find the height of the pack height of the cooling tower okay height of cooling tower we will solve numerical using the so in this it is energy balance as well as material balance will be used in this one okay so that's why as a prior to this one we, we should know what is psychometric chart how to make use of psychometric chart to determine humidity absolute humidity molal humidity uh, what is adiabatic saturation curve all that we should be thorough with okay so the please refer to our previous three lectures uh, in which we discuss about all the psychometric chart humidification operation dehumidification operation and numericals are solved in the lecture so those three lectures are important before you come to this lecture so please complete those three lectures and start this lecture if we look at the harmful effects of thermal pollution the first and foremost is decrease in dissolved oxygen levels in water bodies the water body to which the polluted water is discharged from the industries becomes warm and it eventually reduces the dissolved oxygen levels in it 
and the reduced dissolved oxygen levels can cause the marine flora and fauna to suffocate and this may result in anaerobic conditions. Second impact is increased toxins. The release of contaminated water causes a drastic increase in toxin levels. The discharge water can contain dangerous toxins like methane, carbon dioxide, arsenic, etc. Such toxins can have a severe impact on the local aquatic ecosystem and the ecology. And the third part is biodiversity reduction. Biodiversity is essential for maintaining the balance of the ecosystem. When the pollution levels increase in water bodies due to the thermal pollution, it can make the aquatic ecosystem unfit for many species. The adverse impact on the ecology. The ecological balance should be maintained at all costs. There are aquatic species that are highly sensitive to the rise in water temperature. Some of them can be sensitive to even 1 degree temperature rise. And the finally, the impact on reproductive systems. This thermal pollution can negatively affect the reproductive systems of the aquatic species. While they may still be able to mate for reproduction, the chances of defects in newborns will be drastically higher. Increase in metabolic rate Thermal pollution can affect the metabolic rate of aquatic species. It causes an increase in certain enzyme activities that force the species to consume more food. Loss of species continued and sharp increases in thermal pollution can lead to loss of aquatic species. Many species would find it difficult to survive in such extreme conditions. This may even lead to their migration to a more suitable environment and the loss of the marine species. So overall, it affects the biodiversity. Whenever you cross any nuclear power plant or thermal power plant, you can easily distinguish a cooling tower because it's a very tall tower. It may be in hyperbolic design. Okay. So cooling tower is a place where the coolant medium or water is cooled to reuse in the power plant. In this tall, as long as 200 meters height concrete structure, the hot water is allowed to cool down, thereby allowing the thermal energy to get into the environment along with the atmospheric air. Okay, so as I told, the cooling tower may be as tall as 200 meters height, and there are two types of cooling towers. One is cross flow cooling tower, and another one is counter flow cooling towers. So these counter flow, counter flow cooling towers are generally of hyperbolic in design. Okay, so first let us look at the counter flow cooling towers. If you look at the components that are present in the counter flow cooling towers, we have a cold water basin. So cold water basin, it's like a pond we will have. Cold water reservoir at the bottom of the tower. Hot water which needs to be cooled is pumped and distributed over the fill, fill media and there will be using a air inlet section. It will be like windows in the toilets we keep, no? One lower, lower. The lower is a window blind or shutter with horizontal slats that are angled to admit the light and the air, but to keep out the rain or sunshine, right? So they are kept in a particular angle. So usually in blinds or vacuum material, which is called as fill media. So we will have a tall fill media, which may be of several height, meters height, depending upon the interaction between the gas liquid ratio. We will have the height of the fill material varying from uh, meters, varying in meters. Okay. So then we, at the top, we will have a liquid distributing system, which is maybe consisting of spray nozzles, inlet pipe, pumping the liquid into this one all that will be present which is distribution system liquid distribution system and there will be at the top of the tower we want to reduce the amount of water that is escaping with the air so there will be mist eliminator will be present at the top okay so these are some of the components that are typically present in a counter current cooling towers okay so what we what happens if you look at the operation the hot water is pumped into the spray nozzles so the hot water will be pumped through the inlet pipes and through the nozzles that will be distributed all across the cross-section area of the tower 
okay so then what happens due to natural convection cold air will be drawn into the tower and the air will collect the heat from the water which is falling down so that way by due to natural convection we are not using any external pump or fans blowers are not used in this turn okay so due to natural convection cold air is drawn into the tower from outside through the air inlet okay so the cold air will cool down the water which is stored at the very base of the tower okay so note that during this process two percentage of water is evaporated and this cooling tower works on the principle of natural circulation because due to change in the density because we have hot air and we have cold air so hot air will try to rise up okay so the warm air will be rising up and it will try to escape through the openings at the top that is how this one will work if you look at the cross flow cooling tower it will have the following components this cross flow cooling towers will have drift eliminators distribution system same liquid distribution system and it will have fill media and exhaust fans because in this type of cooling tower we will have an exhaust fan okay so depending upon the position whether it is kept at the bottom or the top it is further classified but in this example i am showing you a exhaust fan which is kept at the top okay so in this case what happens is hot water is sent through a water inlet into this cooling tower and the distributed the water gets distributed through the fill media okay so using the water filter water distribution system uh, nozzles or sprays the water is distributed all across the what do you call that one fill media okay so by gravity the water will be falling down from one level to another level which in the fill media okay so the gravity causes the water to cascade down through the fill media and the fill media breaks this water into small water droplets so thereby we will when it is in small shapes we get more uh, larger surface area for the gas liquid interaction that is mainly here we want heat transfer to take place between gas and the liquid that is here the air and the water so between air and water heat transfer is taking place and we have an exhaust fan installed at the top and what it will do it will when the fan is rotating so it will draw the cold air from the sides or at the bottom wherever air inlet is there the cold air will be drawn into this tower and through this fill media air will be interacting with the liquid droplets and it will take away the heat from the water and this hot air will be leaving the top of the tower okay so that way here also some amount of evaporation of water will be taking place and after passing through this air media after passing through this fill media water is collected in the bottom because liquid water moving by gravity okay after passing through the fill media the water will be collected at the bottom bottom where we have a water basin okay so this cold air which is collected at the bottom of the tower it is it will be withdrawn using a pump which will send it to the chiller condenser section okay and if we look at the difference between cross flow and counter flow there is a major difference is about the the pattern in which they come in contact with each other if you look at the water flow the air flow direction is perpendicular to the water flow direction in case of cross flow that is it is perpendicular in nature air flow is perpendicular to water water is by gravity going down air is going perpendicular direction to the water flow in direction whereas in counter flow air and water come in contact in counter flow direction they come in opposite directions okay so that is the major difference between cross flow and counter flow cooling towers so based on where we keep the fan in the cooling tower we can classify them as induced draft and forced draft or natural draft cooling towers so based on the fan where we keep the fan we can classify them as induced draft or forced draft or if you are not having any fan it is natural draft cooling tower okay so the natural draft cooling tower are large concrete chimney they generally used for water flow rates as high as 45000 meter cube per hour and it is mainly used in the power stations okay mechanical draft power stations 
we have this type of one okay this cooling rate will depend upon the what is the diameter of the fan what is the speed of the operation all that okay so this concrete tower will be uh, if the concrete tower is less than 200 meters no fan is required okay okay if you look at the advantages and disadvantages associated with counter flow towers the advantages are the coldest water comes in contact with the driest air thereby maximizing the tower performance and smaller footprint of the tower that means it occupies less space smaller tower height due to compact infill infill refers to filling material okay and there is more efficient air water contact due to droplet distribution in the fills and there are some disadvantages associated with these counter flow towers there will be noise production due to spraying and falling of water and the top of the column is not closed therefore direct sunlight in the tower basin might trigger the algae growth in the water basin and water distribution system might be clogged due to water borne debris and there is uneasy maintenance of the water distribution system and drift loss due to traveler distribution system will be there and there is a problem during winter time icing of air inlet lowers is a big issue so manually it has to be removed you can see that here there are three conditions there is an increase the amount of ice which is safe you can see that uh, if it is completely blocking the path of air that is unsafe condition so in that case manually the ice needs to be removed so that is one of the headache during winter so th these are some of the different construction or these different models in which these counter flow towers are being built as i said it's not that only hyperbolic uh, shape it is being built you can see n number of hyperbolic structures but for that common inlet of lowers are there you can see the air inlet is made common so you can see the designs being made so these are some of the examples for counter flow towers The air distribution system for these counter flow as well as cross flow towers have their own advantages and disadvantages inherent because of their respective designs. Both these tower systems are designed for a given duty. Let me say for a given required cooling tower performance. Therefore, their thermal performance and their cooling capability for both the tower systems if designed very well will be equal okay so if you look at the advantages asso associated with the cross flow tower sir if you want to have a minimize pump head you want to minimize the pumping and piping cost to minimize the operating cost when noise limitations are a significant factors when variance in hot water flow is expected and if you want to have a easy maintenance this is a big concern for us in that case this cross flow tower should be specified okay so the components of a cooling tower are frame and casing fill cold water basin drift eliminators air inlet lowers nozzles fans pumps and chemical dosing systems okay now try to answer these questions what are the factors responsible for creating a natural draft? Why the counter flow towers are hyperbolic in shape? What is the advantage associated with it? And what is the difference between a cooling tower and a condenser? Well, so we have discussed uh, several type of cooling towers. Please watch this demonstration video for evaporative cooling tower. Evaporative cooling towers. Evaporative cooling towers keep large buildings and industrial machines cool. Circulating liquid carries the excess heat to the cooling tower, typically installed on the roof. The tower uses cold water to cool that fluid, then transfers the heat to the atmosphere through an evaporation process. Pumps move the fluid carrying the excess heat 
through the cooling tower's closed circuit coil. Nozzles spray the coil with cold water. The spray water absorbs the heat and the cold fluid returns to the building. Fans blow air onto the now warm spray water to evaporate just enough to release the heat. Then the cold water loops back to the spray system and the cycle repeats. Depending on the size, the coil is made up of as many as 56 circuits. A circuit is a zigzag tube, one inch in diameter. The mill forms a continuous straight tube from a strip of carbon steel. The rollers progressively curve the edges upward until they join at the top. The last station on the mill welds the joined edges together to form a continuous seam. Next, workers transfer the straight tube to a semi-automated tube bender, which forms it into a circuit. Depending on the size of the circuit, there can be as few as six bends or as many as 18. To make a circuit with 18 bends can require a straight tube that's over 300 feet long. Once all the circuits are ready, workers stack them on a frame. Then weld the tube ends to the corresponding holes of a steel plate. They close up the plate with a cover called a header. After clamping the header in position, they weld it in place, forming a pressure-tight seal. The coil is now fully constructed and ready for testing. Technicians submerge it in water then pump air through at high pressure and look for bubbles, which would indicate a leak in a circuit. If they do find a leak, they either repair or replace the circuit. Meanwhile, work is underway on the cooling tower's mechanical section. A computer-guided laser cutter prepares the steel panels that make up the section's rugged structure. Workers then bend the panels where required with a machine called a press brake. Then they assemble the panels to build the structure. Meanwhile, another team has assembled the mechanical section ceiling, which houses the fans. Workers lower this onto the structure. Inside the mechanical section, they install the belt that links the motor's pulley to each fan pulley. After tightening the belt screw with an impact wrench, they test the fans. Meanwhile, the coil has been dipped in molten zinc to make it corrosion resistant. Workers mount it next to the cooling tower's mechanical section. They cover it with the steel housing and install the water spray system on top of it. The sprayed cold water absorbs the heat from the fluid circulating through the coil. The fans then cool the water by evaporation as it flows downward through a bundle of PVC sheets. The machine first heats the PVC to soften it, then stamps it with a mold plate. This imprints a proprietary pattern of peaks and valleys. This pattern is the secret to the evaporative cooling process because it moves the air and spreads the water in a way that maximizes efficiency. Workers stack the sheets on pole supports to construct a bundle of 300 sheets. After placing the bundle in a housing, they install it over a basin. This basin collects the cold water before it's pumped back up to the sprayers to repeat the cycle. This completes the cooling tower's lower module. They now mate it with the upper module, containing the fans, coil, and spray system. This evaporative cooling tower has more than 300 times the capacity of a typical residential air conditioning system. Now that's pretty cool. So there are two types of uh, cooling tower as I said, one is cross flow and counter flow. The advantage is less recirculation than the forced draft towers. Disadvantage is fans and motor drive mechanism requires weather proofing. So that is the disadvantage with respect to induced draft cooling towers. Okay.
so in induced draft cooling towers hot water centers at the top air enters at the bottom and exits at the top okay it uses forced and induced draft fans induced draft mean fan is kept at the top induced draft means forced draft mean fan will be kept at the bottom okay Cooling towers work basically on the principle of evaporation. So in the process, the sensible heat of the hot water is converted into latent heat of vaporization, thus reducing the temperature of the exposed surface area of the water to the air. More the surface area of the water exposed to the air, greater is the cooling, thus required lesser height of construction of cooling tower. And this is why water is generally sprinkled into the cooling tower. When we are uh, sprinkling the water, we have more interfacial surface area, so that is why it is preferred. And to create more turbulence, sometimes cooling waters have packings. However, in case of this closed circuit drying, the water is air cooled without immediate contact. So, in this process, there may be loss of water both due to evaporation as well as almost all the natural draft cooling towers have same three common problems. Let us see what are they. Three most common problems faced in a natural draft cooling towers are uneven water loading, excessive wall water and inadequate water distribution. See first if you look at the uneven water loading, almost all the cooling tower nozzle spray they are in flowing through a round circular pipe. Okay, So the, there is the problem, a circular shape cannot cover a square shaped area. right? Hence, really they are oversized. Okay, so either they are undersized or oversized. So to compensate it, companies design in overlap design. That means to overlap a square pattern, they make a bigger circle, circular shaped nozzle. Why this is matters? Let us see what is the fill media working. How the fill media works. What is the fill media? It is a series of corrugated films bound together to form a fill or log. Okay, each of these fills in essence act like a small cooling vessel and they are designed to specifically accommodate less amount of water and more amount of air. Optimally 25% water and 75% air loading should be there. If any deviation in this air water ratio is there, there will be change in the performance of this cooling tower. For example, if you consider the high water by air ratio, it will result in poor fill performance. Because when the water loading becomes heavy, what will happen? When the water loading becomes heavy, with the overlap occurs, what will happen? It will restrict the air flow. So if you look at the arrows here, we have red arrows and blue arrows. These red arrows will be moving. Uh, because there is no restriction for it, but when the where, whenever wherever there is water overlap is there, in these places the air flow is restricted. So that means it will result in high pressure drop, and the air. Okay, because of the same circular patterned spray nozzle designs, water hits the wall of the tower which will lead to flooding in the fill media in those areas that is near the walls. What is bad about this wall water is, water had to be pumped to the top of the cooling tower and it is going down without interacting with the air. Moreover, while it is going down to the flooded areas of this one cooling tower, mixing is very low because there is no air flow in those places. So which results in? poor heat transfer. As with the nozzle overlaps, the airflow in the area is restricted and directed into the adjacent fills with low pressures. So again we have another gross waste of pumping because water is pumped but it is not being uh, properly interacting with the air. right? So thereby we have loss of energy also.
ஸோ வெனவர் இனிய கவுண்ட்ரு கரண்ட் கூலிங் டவர் இஸ் டிசைன்ட் ஸோ த ஐடியல் வாட்டர் டிஸ்ட்ரிபியூஷன் இஸ் வி வாண்ட் டு ஹவ் அ யூனிஃபார்ம் வெலாசிட்டி இன் ஆல் த பைப்ஸ் அண்ட் அட் ஈச் நாசில் வி வாண்ட் டு ஹவ் த சேம் ஃப்ளோ ரேட் ஓகே ஸோ தட் மீன்ஸ் வி வாண்ட் டு ஹவ் சேம் அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் வாட்டர் டு பி பாசிங் த்ரூ ஈச் ஆஃப் திஸ் நாசில்ஸ் பட் தேர் கம்ஸ் அ பிக் சேலஞ்ச் and that is important issue in this operation of cooling tower also okay so what happens in this type of cooling tower is once we switch on this cooling tower the water is entering before the water reaches the dead end of this uh, line in each line the water tends to bleed off in the holes present in the one which are close to the pipe okay so that means we we have an starved lower end where we have less amount of water and we have other end where we have more amount of water which means no two nozzles receive same amount of water that means the water distributed in the each nozzle is varying so the very purpose or the ideal thing which we have assumed that uniform distribution water is not taking place what is happening here here we have an one end where we have very little drops of water is sprayed in one of the nozzles so remember all nozzles are having same design but however we have a low water being sp- passing through this nozzle whereas in other end we have higher flow rates so that is the major issue thereby we don't have a proper uh, heat transfer taking place that is there is no proper cooling taking place okay in addition to this aging of the pipe fouling in the pipe r- will affect the roughness of the pipe right so again you have friction factor changing pressure drop increasing all that you have studied in fluid mechanics course so in addition to this improper orifice in the nozzles pump water uh, diverted to the other operations or if you say fouling and plugging taking place of the nozzles and uh, if you would use the pump capacity which is less than the desired capacity all this will compound to the problem leading to poor performance of the cooling tower okay another important issue associated with cooling tower operation is entrainment so entrainment is carry away of the water along with the air okay so when it will happen whenever we have an high velocity air flow when the air flow rate is very high we have drift loss so what is that the water vapor this is not smoke this is water vapor so water is carried away by the air that means we are lo- there is a loss of water significant amount of loss of water taking place okay so this drift loss not only it makes in loss in water it is going to damage the parts because when the moisture is reaching the other parts of the unit we are going to have lot of loss due to corrosion also okay so the way it will happen whenever there is a light water loading and high velocity profiles so there will be damage caused because of the moisture reaching the unwanted areas so there will be maintenance requirements so a person a person has to enter and repair the moving power, repair the parts of the cooling tower okay to avoid the entrainment we have to make use of drift eliminators we have to stop the entrainment because if you look at this picture the one at the top of this chimney is not smoke it is moisture that means loss of water is taking place drift eliminator is an important component of most of the cooling towers used nowadays in various industries where the harmful droplets have the potential to be released into the environment these droplets are composed of minerals chemicals and waters which can impact not only the environment but the valuable equipment also so these harmful droplets are known as drift water loss from a cooling tower is inevitable however to make sure the water is harmless vapor is possible and essential to address this loss of harmful droplets a drift eliminator must be installed okay so this one it is not an one style in, installment because that it should be properly designed a product and it should have a quality material and maintenance has to be done at regular intervals usually polypropylene material which will prevent water loss from the cooling tower into the air is being used 
okay it's usually accomplished by an interrupting to the water by directional change of air flow at a different points in the cooling towers by changing the flow we interrupt the velocity this in turn stops the water from reaching the exit points since water is a key component to the operation of a cooling tower keeping the water in the cooling tower allows for optimal performance so if you want to minimize the entrainment we have to keep drift eliminators in the tower top of the tower okay so actually what is the theoretical limit to which the water can be cooled is what is the wet bulb temperature of the air beyond which we cannot cool the water okay so if you want to minimize the entrainment we have to keep drift eliminators in the tower top of the tower okay so actually what is the theoretical limit to which the water can be cooled is what is the wet bulb temperature of the air beyond which we cannot cool the water okay well in this lecture we have discussed about several type of cooling towers its working mechanism its components and we have seen some of the demonstration videos for cooling towers thank you so much for joining my classroom meet you in the next lecture bye bye